Hello, everyone. I'm Michael McNutt, Director of Education and Events for WEEDI, a nationally recognized membership association for health IT guidance and collaboration. With a focus on advancing standards for electronic administrative transactions and promoting data privacy and security, WEEDI has been instrumental in aligning the industry to harmonize administrative and clinical data. On September 21st, to commemorate Telehealth Awareness Week, WEEDI will be hosting a very special virtual spotlight showcasing the value and future of telehealth. Read more about the event and register at weedy.org. But today it's my pleasure to chat for a few minutes with one of our presenters, Ron Emerson, Global Healthcare Lead with Zoom Video Communications. Ron has more than 20 years experience in the healthcare industry, having worked on a number of telemedicine programs in nearly 50 countries. Recognized as a thought leader in telehealth, Ron has developed a variety of innovative telehealth applications and consulted on telehealth deployments worldwide. Ron, welcome and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to not only chat with me today, but also joining our Telehealth Spotlight on September 21st. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. It's good to be here. I'm sure that some people are watching this interview surprised that Zoom has a healthcare division. We're all familiar with Zoom, the product, uh, the, with virtual meetings and connecting with friends and others. It's been somewhat of a lifeline for many of us, especially during this pandemic. But some might not be familiar with Zoom's healthcare footprint. Could you offer a couple of seconds on the background of Zoom's work in healthcare? When did it start? How's it grown? The floor is yours. No, wonderful. Um, and, and that's a great question. And, and I think you know we've all um, just seen so much change with the, the hyper digitalization of technology and virtual care. Um, out of the essence of trying to not be exposed to um, the the virus, right during the pandemic and. Um, but I think what's important for people to know is that, of course, Zoom has been in healthcare uh, before COVID, and some people think of Zoom as a COVID company. But since 2016, in the United States, Zoom has actually offered a business associate agreement, which is which is um, um, which really shows our dedication to the industry well before. And if you look at Zoom in general, just in the U.S., we have over 45,000 business associate agreements, um, so we have a huge footprint. Um, Zoom is the telehealth solution of choice for nine out of the 10 top hospitals. If you look at U.S. News and World Report, um, Definitive Healthcare actually did a, uh, they do surveys on hospitals and they have Zoom as the market share leader at about 32.6%. And that's actually grown from about a year ago when the pandemic was in full swing. So it's actually moving the other direction where Zoom wasn't just a, a quick fix to get people through the pandemic. Um, this, you know, sort of seen as too simplistic for telehealth. Zoom is actually the front runner and the number one used application for clinicians to actually see their patients. And the American Medical Association did a study as well that showed that Zoom and um, the telephone were actually the two um, most used platforms for interaction of telehealth. So we're well entrenched in the space. Um, we do it on our own. Um, as we're in a Zoom meeting, everybody, most people have been in Zoom meetings. Um, you can use Zoom out of the box, as we say. Or, of course, we do a um, very good job with our APIs and SDKs, which for those that don't know, those are integration tools where we can integrate into the workflow of, let's say, electronic medical records so that healthcare professionals can mimic what they do on a day-to-day -day basis when they're providing virtual care. So they don't have to change their workflows, which is important. Excellent. Now, and I mentioned the over 20 years in healthcare. So you've, you've seen some evolution. You kind of I'm sure have you ever stepped back and did the Paul Rudd look at us meme every now and then like, wow, how, how does it feel to be part of this unique element of healthcare and watching these kind of quantum advances over the past 20 years, a, a lot of them kind of encapsulated in the past three years sometimes. Yeah, you know, Michael, it's just been, it, it really has been amazing. I, you know, I was a, um, I was a U.S. Marine. I got out and I got my bachelor's degree in nursing and and um, when I was 30, I actually started as a nurse in a telemedicine network in the northeastern U.S. in Maine. And um, I was a nurse out training other nurses and presenting patients to providers. But back then, you know, Medicare um, would reimburse under very strict regulations. Medicaid's didn't reimburse. Pretty much all of them didn't reimburse. Privates didn't reimburse. Um, private insurances didn't reimburse. And, and we were getting funding through the Office for Advancement of Telemedicine to actually you know, do studies and show the value of telehealth. And, you know, one of my first visits with a clinician, I remember when I was a nurse to, to try to grow the network in Maine, um, what was called the Maine Telehealth Network. Uh, 
was an oncologist and he looked at me and he said, do you want me to see my patients over a TV? And I said, uh, yes, sir. And he said, get out of my office. And, uh, you know, people didn't even know what telehealth or telemedicine was the term. Um, so just to see this growth over the last three years and, and, um, you know, not just see the growth for those of us that worked hard, but just the benefit that it brings to people. And, you know, there's a correlation between access to care and quality to care. We all know that. And as we're learning, we're all still in a, a, a really steep learning curve because of the hyper acceleration of the use of virtual technologies mm -hmm. and the necessity, right? And um, But we're getting much better at inclusion exclusion when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate, um, when it can lower the barrier to the entry point of getting people in the healthcare system. So there's just been so many other things besides the regulatory part that's moved forward the learning curve of when it's appropriate and when it's not and most effective has also grown with it, which is, of course, it's tremendously exciting. Yep, I uh, know, definitely. And looking back, kind of looking at these past three years, uh, while you mentioned Zoom was health, was part of healthcare prior to pan the pandemic, the idea of telehealth really took a hold of the entire population during the global pandemic, which we are still experiencing. Talk to me about like the first couple of days, weeks of the global pandemic and how Zoom reacted. Um, similar to a lot of other companies, I'm sure there was a lot of pivoting, a lot of quick agile thinking that was needed in order to, you know, become the Zoom that we now know within healthcare. Yeah, it's 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 really a remarkable story when when you think about it, and um, and it would be interesting in the future when you know we look back as far as you know just unprecedented growth and how an organization has handled that, and you know I just give full credit to the entire Zoom team and the executive staff and 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 just you know to manage that and just to give you some of the scale of this, if you look at December of two thousand nineteen, um, Zoom had about ten million daily meeting participants, so every day. December, about 10 million people, they would get on Zoom. Three and a half months later, so you go to April, 300 million people a day yeah. were getting on Zoom. So that's how fast Zoom grew, right? And then to be able to do that, um, you know, initially with the same staff and to be able to scale at that level is just a, just a, um, just a, 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 just true, you know, hats off to the engineering and operations team at Zoom to be able to meet that scale, which they did to, you know, and, and these are my words, but as a lot of people say, to really keep the world running um, to the best of the ability at that time. But that's how fast. And then the growth in healthcare was, of course, you know, um, the same. And we would literally um, have hospital systems that we would spin up over a weekend with seven, eight, ten thousand 10,000 doctors. We would have them going in like three, four or five days. They'd be up and running and be able to virtually see patients. That's how fast a lot of that happened. Well, wow, that was incredible. So, so props, a shout out to the entire team over there for doing a fantastic job. Um, regarding the healthcare industry, you know, those people that you are helping out, what have you heard from payers and providers so far regarding their experiences using Zoom as a healthcare tool? Yeah, it's, um, you know, overwhelmingly, it's, it's, it's been positive. Um, you know, speaking about Zoom in particular, as I said, Zoom continues to grow in market share. So, uh, you know, more people are using Zoom for virtual visits um, as far as the percentage of the market is in, that's involved in telehealth. So we're growing. So it's been a good experience. Um, you know, we are learning a lot as far as using Zoom in regards to, as I said earlier, um, when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate. And, and, and the interesting thing, I think, Michael, that we're all learning is that, you know, originally we're moving more towards value-based care models, right? And and when I speak on the 21st, I'm really excited to talk more about this. And I'll, I'll, I don't want to give away what I'm going to talk about there because um, that's for that session. But, you know, about 40 percent of Americans are underneath alternative payment systems. We have accountable care models, you know, where we're, where we're being measured on value and quality of care. And that's just not about the clinician seeing the patient. That's about the entire care team being able to see the patient and provide wellness and prevention to change behavior. Right. So we don't have exacerbations. Um, it's about different payment models, capitated rates. It's about, um, you know, um, um, such things as a hospital at home and just different models that we're using that that we know provide better outcomes and um, increase better discharge plan and care coordination, all of these other things. So when people think of Zoom, you know, don't just think of the telehealth piece, um, but also think of Zoom as being that platform that's being used every day internally for communication use, which it is throughout organizations like you and I are using it right now. Exactly. Think of it, the body of knowledge of medicine doubles every four to six years, um, using it, it being the solution of choice for educators to provide that expansion of medical knowledge from those who have it to those who don't. 
um, internal trainings. And then, like I said earlier, to actually reach out and reach people where they're at in their homes to, to, for wellness and prevention. And payment models are aligning with that behavior change um, that we've needed for a long time. And, and, and remember when we, you know, when he was here so much about PPOs and HMOs and capitated rates, well, that was great, but you know what? I don't think a letter in the mail saying do this or do that on behavior change is really going to affect my behavior, but I do think um, high level communication and some of it live, like we're doing now, some of it, not live, some of it in other forms does help change behavior. So um Overall, um, it's been very positive to give you a, a statistic on that. Um, Zoom did a survey in uh, 10 different countries with over 8,300 um, people that actually participated in it. And we asked people that it actually had a telemedicine visit within the last six months, what their plans were for the future or what they would like in regards to how they receive their treatment. And of course, we'll focus on the U.S. because um, that's where we're at. 62% of Americans who actually had had a telemedicine visit within six months over video had said that they would like to continue to have a hybrid model of care. So some in person, some over video. 34% said, you know what, I'm good. I'll stay with in-person care. And then um, about 4% actually said that they wanted only video only, which when you look at the need for objective data, you know, that's not very realistic unless maybe it's, you know, mental health services, of course. But but um, so we know patients like it. And satisfaction levels for telehealth for years has been, you know, over the high levels of satisfaction, the 90th percentile for a number of number of years. So it's been very positive. I'll address that 34% in a second, my next question. But my, my question right now is, uh, you just mentioned mental health. Um, from, from what you've received in terms of data, has their experiences been varied based on discipline or the actual experience? For instance, a standard medical appointment versus telepsychiatry, uh, mental health. Uh, so are you seeing uh, one flowing, one higher level of satisfaction than the other? Because um, I know they're two kind of unique aspects of telehealth. Yeah, and, and, and that's a great question. And it's and it's a little more complicated because the, there's some nuances. So when I think of telehealth, I actually thought about it years ago. I was like, what are the, you know, having, you know, having been a nurse on the front line, then becoming an executive director of a telemedicine network and then working for larger organizations where I've, you know, worked with government organizations and been around the world doing telehealth. I'm like, what are the three things I've always been challenged on and that we really need to understand? One is, patient satisfaction. So you asked about the different disciplines, mental health compared to, um, let's just say actual physical ailments, um, other physical ailments besides mental. Um, you know, the first thing is that patient satisfaction in both areas are in the high 90s percentile because it's video and that we, um, for the most part in mental health, do not need objective data. And objective data is like looking in an ear. You know, there might be little subtle things like tardive dyskinesia or something like that. Providers feel like they can have a very good interaction and patients actually feel very, very comfortable. And we have a lot of older data, even Michael, where we've done comparison studies where we would have a doctor um, see, let's say you're a psychiatrist and you see me over video um, and then you make a diagnosis and then we disconnect the call. And then another psychiatrist walks in the room and sees me in person. The diagnosis that you two make, there's no variance than if we both did it in person or over video. So we know that we have good data. And the experience, I think, for mental health has always been in the very high, high 90th percentiles for, for telehealth. People like the interaction. Um, on the physical side, it really goes down to uh, um, and, and, and plays more into the actual purpose of the consultation. Um, in, in healthcare and medical, there's subjective data. That's what the patient says. And then there's objective data of what you can actually see. You know, there are some programs that have inclusion exclusion criteria. If someone has a sore throat, they say, you know what, we need to do a rapid strep. We'd rather you just come in. That's their inclusion exclusion criteria. Others feel like they can treat it. Um, others try to treat it, but they draw their own lines in that. But the satisfaction level, I think, as far as the patient is they, is if, if they can have a decreased and easier entry point into the healthcare system and they can still get what they need that's necessary and it doesn't cost them anymore. So patient satisfaction, clinical efficacy, can they get what they need accomplished? And then the return on investment and the patient being happy with what they paid for, that the levels are quite high also. So there hasn't been a huge variance. But of course, I think we would all be very clear that if I'm in my home and I'm on my phone like this, or I'm on my computer without medical diagnostic devices or another healthcare professional, men mental health really, you know, just bodes well to the actual use of video. 
Now, talking about your you survey from a couple of questions ago, and you mentioned the 34% and the 60% that would like the hybrid and they kind of don't like the hybrid, et cetera. As working in a company that really is about telecommunication, about teleconferencing, uh, about digital health, distance health, distance learning, how do you see in terms of best practice, best to blend the accessibility of technology and the kind of ease of use and it's so easy in front of us that digital health brings with that kind of human nature that we need to see, touch, kind of interact with people. We're running into the same problem from an educational perspective, moving now into in-person meetings and conferences. By the way, October 25th through the 27th, National Conference with Weedy in Washington, D.C. Had to do a shameless plug there. But, But how do you blend that unique digital accessibility along with that human interaction that so many of us need. Yeah, I, I think it's exactly what we talked about earlier. And I, I think even, you know, Zoom is, you know, we at Zoom, we believe in um, when possible, you know, hybrid hybrid work models. It's like, let the actual, just think about banking, I guess, Michael, in the way that we used to interact with the banking system, right? We used to always have to go to the bank for everything. Now we go to the bank for specific things that need um a higher level of um, interaction or whatever that might be when you go to the bank. Other times we just sort of do it from a digital first perspective, right? And then I also think that we just give people, you know, to the best of our ability, we give people choices. And we allow people that want that in inner, you know, that 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 high level um interaction. And even me with my doctor now, you know, I I I I could do nothing but but video, but you know, but I use a hybrid model of care with my provider and I have to drive an hour each way to see him because I think that it is important that I get to see him once in a while. And um so we basically rotate my visits based on what's needed. So we'll do we'll do a telehealth visit and then we'll do a in-person visit and telehealth. So I think what a lot of people are looking at is using hybrid models but making it more efficient. So if I'm if I've went in and I just had a lot of love, a lot of blood um, draws and um, I'm going back to get my results, you know, I think we'd all be pretty hard pressed to really justify someone missing a half a day of work and drive in to just sit and talk to their provider, right? But if I have a mass in my stomach where the doctor needs to basically, you know, palpate, so I think it just cannot be an all or nothing model. There needs to be um, escalation and clinical workflows that allow the appropriate clinical situations to be handled appropriately. So the patient feels like they got it. And then the other part of that is, you know, how do we handle that 34% is, as I say, we don't make them and informed consents can even help with that, you know, and and, and kind of one of the models we used to use is, you know, we would say that, you know, if you were the provider, um, do not feel that a um, proper level of clinical assessment or dialogue was able to be handled over this telehealth consultation, you have the right to an in-person visit as if the technology did not exist. So do what you would have done before without telemedicine. So we're not telling people they have to do it. We're just saying this is an option to lower the threshold and the barrier to you getting the care that you need. And we love options, definitely. Uh, We're speaking with Ron Emerson, Global Healthcare Lead with Zoom. Uh, Before we close out, of course, I have to ask you kind of the crystal ball question. Um, In terms of telehealth, like I said, we're seeing quantum leaps and evolution and things that are cool now or a year ago. We're already, people are already excited and moving forward. There's talk of enhanced remote patient monitoring. Um, I just finished a podcast interview with a gentleman who's working on healthcare in the metaverse. Uh, So we're already taking these jumps. Digital healthcare, telehealth, whatever we'd like to call it, is here to stay and is evolving at a rapid rate. Um, What do you see? As, as one of the kind of foremost subject matter experts when discussing telehealth, what do you see in your crystal ball in terms of the next quantum leap uh, for digital and distance healthcare? Yeah, um, I, I honestly believe the next quantum leap is that um, eventually we will have a um, digital first healthcare system. And what I mean by that, I don't mean digital only. I mean that um, digital first means that a lot of the time or the majority of the time, I think we can have our initial interactions uh, through technology such as we're doing using today to make better dispositions so we can treat things quickly, decrease exacerbations, manage those things so we're not using more expensive resources such as the um, um, such as the emergency room in the homes, but then also have the necessary patients come in when they need to. And have people basically and, and healthcare professionals practice at the highest level of their license. Now, again, that doesn't mean digital only, but I do think digital first. And there are some countries, Switzerland's already doing this. You know, before they go to the doctor, they have to call in and they have to have an interaction 
um, so that they can make, it's like a mini triage so they can make the best decision rather than the default is just automatically set up an appointment and come in. That's awesome. Ron, it, it's been a pleasure to pick your brain um, a, a little as we approach our September 21st virtual spotlight on telehealth. Best of success to you and everyone at Zoom, and we look forward to hearing from you um, at our spotlight. Once again, September 21st, register at weedy.org. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the most engaging speakers in the industry, you'll not only hear from Ron, but also speakers from Microsoft, Amwell, the American Telemedicine Association, and Elevance. Our opening speaker is the always entertaining Dr. James Stalkup, Chief Medical Information Officer with the Cherokee Nation. So we invite you to sign up to attend the spotlight September 21st. Use the code TELEHELP all caps, telehealth, to receive 20% off our registration rate. Registration includes the live stream as well as a recording of the event. Uh, on behalf of Weedy, take care, and we look forward to seeing you soon.